All right, guys. Well, according to the Washington Post, new research shows exercise is protective against being hospitalized, being severely ill, and dying from COVID-19. In today's session, we're going to break down this fascinating paper that we actually covered about a week ago. But because the media is now talking about it, I want to share with you the details of this particular study that was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. This is a fascinating study on multiple levels. And essentially what the research shows, this is the punchline. People who don't exercise compared to people who do have a 290 percent increased odds of dying from COVID-19. Now, where have you heard from the media, from policymakers, from health officials that exercise is protective against severe disease, hospitalization, and death? Remember what we did, my friends. We closed the gyms, yet you could go buy pizza, donuts, and corn dogs at Costco, Target. All of the fast food chains were wide open, but yet gyms were deemed dangerous and places where pestilence was flying everywhere. Now, I know a lot of people are defending the policymakers at the time by saying they made the right call. They made the right call to put sand in skateboard parks in Southern California. They made the right call to arrest people for paddleboarding by themselves in the middle of the ocean or in the UK. Even people, there was a group of women who went out walking. This made international news. They got arrested by the police. Here in the King County area where I live in Washington, just outside of Seattle, there was women who got arrested or threatened by the police for walking their children at the park. The park that literally my daughter and I go to pretty much every day had crime scene tape all over the swing set. And when I put my daughter on the swing, I had three neighbors calling the cops on me, my friends. This is how insane the world became about a respiratory virus with a case fatality ratio now of 0.2%. Okay, so we're going to talk about how exercise is is medicine. The effect size that exercise has when it comes to preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death from SARS-CoV-2 is greater than that of the vaccinations. Okay, where have you heard about this? I'm not saying that if you want to get vaccinated, you shouldn't, but every single person should be exercising. About a month ago, we covered a new study that found that exercise enhances the post-vaccination immunological effects. So if you're pro-vaccine, you should be super pro-exercise. Uh, but what did people do? They went and got their vaccine and went and had a donut and took a selfie on it because Krispy Kreme's was giving out free donuts if you were fully vaccinated, which is completely, it's, it's, it's insane. Now, I'm sharing this with you because, again, the Washington Post and to their credit, they've covered a few studies and, and that talking about lifestyle, how lifestyle impacts uh, disease trajectory. But by and large, Washington Post, New York Times, they have ignored actual ways that we can become healthy. And they have really favored some and, and promoted news stories that coincide with the con contemporary consensus. Stay home sanitize yourself, order fast food uh, from Uber Eats and delivery systems and things like that, and isolate in your home. But we actually now know, and, and this study, this journal, I should say, published a related study showing that the obesity prevalence increased some, I think it was like 12%. So it went from 40% of US adults are obese to now 43.5% are obese. Now that's a problem because most of those people are not going to lose the weight. Now, most of those people also have increased risk for a myriad of different diseases, not only just increased susceptibility to severe infections, but dying from, from congestive heart failure, from diabetes. We're gonna talk about dementia in another video. A new study showed that consumption of ultra processed foods increases uh, brain decay and actually decreases cognitive capacity and executive function. But let's talk about exercise and really drill down because I know around the holiday season, you're going to be with friends and family. They're going to ask you why you haven't gotten your seventh booster shot. And you're going to say, hey, I go to the gym. I exercise. So therefore, I have lowered my risk and likelihood of getting severely ill from both RSV, from influenza, from COVID, whatever. This data is not new. And that's why in January 27th of 2020, I started sharing this research showing, hey, friends, I know it's a new virus, but we know from other viruses that exercise is protective. And so let's talk about it. Now, it's important to recognize there are 25 studies, randomized clinical trials, observational studies, retrospective studies that have looked at people's self-reported exercise habits and correlated those with adverse events and poor trajectory with SARS-CoV-2. Okay, and they go on to say, there are 25 some odd studies and meta-analysis reporting on the association of physical activity or fitness with adverse outcomes for those infected with COVID-19. There was a consistent dose response association with exercise reducing the likelihood of hospitalization and death across lower physical activity categories with the strongest association comparing the always active with always inactive group. 
this is where I want to really focus on because this study found there was 191,000 subjects that were studied in this particular data set as part of Kaiser Permanente. And this is to Kaiser's credit, the second major study from Kaiser. The first one we talked about in April of 2021, that study involved 43,000 people. This one, 191,000 people. This is not like three meatheads versus that are unvaccinated. This is 191,000 people, my friends. And this, this data that was collected before the rollout of vaccines. That's important to recognize and characterize. So they found that any exercise it is protective. I mean, literally just some activity is better than none. However, the downside, and I think this is important to recognize, and especially as we go into the new year, 58% of the people, 58% of the 191,000 subjects were either always or mostly inactive. So literally about two thirds of Americans have an exercise deficiency and only about 24% of people as part of this data set. Now this is Kaiser. It's limited to that. It's here in America, but most people just don't exercise about 27%, only 27% report that they regularly exercise. Now it's important to recognize that as part of this data set, uh, data was collected at three different intervals over the course of months and years leading up to the pandemic. So I guess I haven't been to Kaiser as a, as a patient, but I guess they ask you how many minutes do you exercise per week, per day and so forth. And they have, and, and that's how they collected this. Now, Again, I'm sharing this because so many people promoted lockdowns, they supported closures of gyms, while they incongruently went to Costco, went to the grocery store and bought flour, sugar, soda pop, they went to uh, McDonald's. I remember the Chick-fil-A drive through line throughout the pandemic in Jack in the Box was literally bumper to bumper all day long, yet you couldn't go to the gym. There was a line at Costco. You could do all these things, but you, for now, some of you are saying, well, Mike, you don't need to go to a gym. You can exercise outdoors. Yes, but friends, not everyone has access to outdoor exercise. And I'm not trying to make excuses. If you're a single parent with three kids on homeschool, how are you going to carve out time to go run in the park or do push-ups or things like that? If you live in a condo or apartment, and moreover, some people choose to live in apartment complexes and condos that have a gym there. Those gyms were even closed. I've had some clients who were like, I've been trying to exercise. The reason why I signed, I bought this condo was because they have a nice gym. The gym was closed, right? So please stop making excuses for these irrational policies. As this study concludes, exercise should be part of any viral outbreak or any public health measure to mitigate and reduce the burden on hospitalizations. And, and that was the message for the many of the health experts talked about is hospital capacity, hospital capacity. Well, then let's let people exercise. Let's let the kids go to the skate park. Let's, let, let's not board up. Literally, there's screenshots, you can Google this, where basketball hoops had wood wrapped around them with locks so that kids could not play and people couldn't play basketball. Now, before we continue, friends, I just wanna thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Mike Mutzel. If you're enjoying the content, hit the like button. Be sure to leave a comment below and please share this directly as a text message with someone that you know who can benefit from this and you know that they need to exercise more. Now, because we're talking about exercise, I do want to let you know about our electrolyte sticks. This is a creatine containing electrolyte. A lot of people don't realize that electrolytes and creatine work synergistically to help support healthy hydration and athletic performance. During the new year, if you want to get more physically fit, build more muscle, become metabolically healthy, you should consider the electrolyte sticks before or during your workout. It will help your athletic performance. There's over 340 some odd reviews since launching this earlier this year in 2022. People love this around exercise. It can help you have a better workout. You can save using the code podcast over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Myoscience with an X. Save using the code podcast on the updated electrolyte sticks. So let's get into it. Now we know here's one of the main reasons why exercise is protective because it reduces the very comorbidities, the underlying health conditions that are linked with adverse events like cardiovascular disease, like hypertension, like diabetes. And they talk about that. Exercise also helps lose uh, weight. We know that obesity and being overweight was a major problem. So they go into that. But I, want, I think it's really important to, to recognize here as we talk about COVID, only 5% of people that died from COVID was it the only factor on the death certificate. In over 94.6% of people who died, they had four or more underlying health conditions. So again, think about the public health response and it's important to know history because in the future, there's gonna be a similar 
I can guarantee you in, the, in our lifetime, there's going to be a viral outbreak and we might see history repeat itself. So it's important to remember, my friends, underlying health conditions were the main reason why people died from COVID-19. Exercise helps reduce the risk of those underlying health conditions and also restores the immune dysfunction that leads to severe infections. Okay, really, really important. Here we go. Over the course of the study, 6.3 participants were hospitalized, okay? So only out of 191,000 people, only 6.3% were hospitalized. Remember how a lot of your friends thought, oh, you get COVID, you're gonna go to the hospital. It's only 6.3%. Now, if you look at the data, most of these people that got hospitalized were in their 70s or late 60s. Now, I'm not saying that we should just kill off all the old people. I have people that I care about in their 60s and 70s, but we should be encouraging, especially those people to exercise. And only 3.1% had severe complications out of the 191,000 and only 2.8% died within 90 days of a diagnosis. So again, these are facts that a lot of people don't remember that this thing didn't just kill 50% of people. It was a very small percentage of people. So that's important to recognize. And now that we know that Omicron has become more transmissible, but it's lost a lot of its virulence as a part of its evolution. But let's compare the always inactive group to the active group. This is 139% higher odds of hospitalization and a 291% higher odds of death for people who are always inactive comparing to always active. These are significant numbers, the very high confidence interval. And so the scientists say, these data indicate that if a person with chronic diseases was infected, the odds of hospitalization, inpatient deterioration, and death were lowered among those who engaged in some physical activity before COVID-19 diagnosis compared to those who are always inactive. So some activity would be cleaning the windows, picking up your daughter, doing yard work. You don't even you know, need to necessarily go to a gym. Just doing some movement, 30 to 40 minutes per week. It's not a lot, my friends, but most people don't even do that. They have Siri or Alexa, deliver them fast food and, and order things. So it's important that humans are meant to move. Your body is meant to move. And when you move your muscles, you improve health, you improve blood flow, you do these things. Okay, now let's go back to the some activity group like I was mentioning. So we compared the two groups, the people who are always inactive versus very active. Now let's compare the some activity to always active. So patients in the some activity category had a 43% greater odds of hospitalization and an 83% greater odds of, of deteriorating in the hospital and a 92% greater odds of death compared to people who are always active. So even some activity reduce the odds of death compared to just no activity. So it's literally like a linear iterative stepwise increase. So just go for a walk after a meal. Take your dog for a walk. If you're scared to go outside, then, then invest in a dog, buy a dog, get a pet, find a workout buddy that can help you walk after meals. Start to do some push-ups, some pull-ups, some air squats, some body weight exercises. My friends, you have this. Now, um, I want to finish off this with talking about the obesity prevalence. As I mentioned here, this was also published in this journal. The title of this study was obesity prevalence among us adults during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in short, this is a long study involved thousands of people and looking at body mass indexes and things like that. So there are some limitations with BMI, but they found that obesity rates in America jumped 3% in a very short period of time, increasing from 40% to over 42.5%. Now, this is the important thing, and this is why I, I criticize the decisions of the policymakers and the politicians by closing gyms and, and creating the illusion that exercise or going outdoors is dangerous because a lot of people literally isolated in their homes because they had this perception that if they leave their house, they're going to get some sort of uh, contagion that is going to kill them. And, and this caused people, there was side effects of this, and that is obesity. Now, unfortunately, as we've talked about many times, the group that suffered the most from this is not adults. It was children. It was children between the ages of five and 11. Now I have issues with that because my daughter happens to be right in that age category. I've seen her friends get more overweight. I've seen many of the kids. Now it, it looks to me just through my own eyes that about more than half are overweight or obese. When I pick my daughter up from school, these kids are not riding their bikes to school anymore. They're not walking as much. Parents are driving them. And that is a problem, my friends, because of the recidivism, the ability of the bodies to hang on to the weight and guard that homeostatic metabolic response throughout the lifetime. So we need to start young. My daughter now gets on average between eight and uh, 12,000 steps per day. She has a Fitbit. We need to start tracking our activity. And in closing, 
suggest you monitor this. In a Fitbit, these tools, not super accurate with regards to estimating your VO2 max or the number of calories you burn, but they are good at tracking steps, particularly the Garmin has a nice uh, tracking mechanism. So I have the Garmin uh, Sphinx, uh, I think, sorry, the Phoenix. Um, a lot of people have asked about that. I think it's good to invest in that and try to get between eight and 12,000 steps per day. My clients that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, I encourage them to lift weights at least three days per week. I think that's a minimum effective dose. Some sort of resistance training is going to be helpful, my friends. So let's think better. Let's do better. Let's start encouraging and promoting health and stop defending these irrational decisions that had a lot of blowback in terms of making people more unhealthy. That's the message, my friends. I want you to be healthy. I want your friends and family to be healthy. And if they're very pro-vaccination or pro-mask, then they should be pro-exercise because these things are, they're not mutually exclusive. They're interrelated. Immune dysfunction is reversed when you improve your metabolic health. So let's help people become more metabolically healthy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing this. I'll put links to the study below and related articles in the late press where there was actually a lot of blowback because again, the media sites that promoted lockdowns and supported gym closures are actually now talking about the protective effects of exercise as though it's novel and new. We knew this, my friends, back in January of 2020 when it comes to pathogens. H1N1, seasonal flu, even bacterial infections, people that are overweight, inactive, have worse outcomes. So why would COVID-19 be any different? It's not. We now have the data. We have 25 studies. Exercise is medicine. Please help me share this message because people need to get moving again. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now.